Hello from my back garden. In contrast to most of the previous month, today is a very, very fine day. So a quick introduction if you haven't watched my previous videos. My name's Anthony. I own a nine kilowatt solar powered array that was commissioned in the middle of last November. These uh, are composed of 28 solar panels, uh, which are all connected to a power optimizer, one for each panel. And this is all fed into an eight kilowatt inverter. And the system comes complete with a hot water controller that takes the surplus uh, solar power and uses it to uh, keep my hot water tank uh, uh, topped up. So in contrast to April, the month of May was a very poor month for my solar panels. We had a lot of low pressure systems tracking across the UK, uh, much further south than where that normally would track. This meant that wind directions were predominantly from the north or the east. And those directions are very uh, cloudy and frequently very damp. And that led to uh, very poor solar output for my panels. Really, it was only the last four days of the month that helped to recover the performance of my solar panels. So overall, we only produced 904 kilowatt hours of electricity. And that contrasts with a much better month in April where we had 1.04 megawatt hours of electricity being generated and as you can see from the chart there are a large number of days where performance really wasn't all that good and two days in particular the performance was less than 10 kilowatt hours one of them we only had uh, six and a half kilowatt hours very gray rainy days with no bright spots at all now more generally there was some brightness in the weather but cloud was a dominant feature and it kept the output low so the best day was the 31st of May and we generated just over 54 kilowatt hours of electricity and that is a nice contrast to the rest of the month we had almost unbroken sunshine just a little bit of low cloud in the morning but even so the reduced output didn't affect my electricity consumption all that much all told the proportion of electricity that came from my solar panels was a little bit higher in May than it was in April. And that's mainly on account of the fact that we've got longer daylight hours. The biggest impact of reduced output is more to grid exports. And given that grid exports are much lower in value, three times lower in value compared to uh, avoided uh, grid consumption, economic impact of that lower output is, is mitigated to a certain extent. But nonetheless, grid exports at the moment they're still a major part of the value proposition for my whole solar panel array until I like, get an electric car. So aside from solar panel performance, I've started making some more energy saving investments in my house. So we're gonna go into my kitchen and we're gonna take a look. My kitchen is 28 years old and it's served me well over the last 11 and a half years, but it's time for an upgrade. Now, whenever a room is completely emptied, such as when this kitchen gets stripped out. That's the perfect opportunity to uh, consider upgrades to the thermal envelope of the walls of your house. So as you can see now, the kitchen walls have been ripped out. This exposes all the cavities. And here you can see we've got uh, fiberglass insulation. And just taking this out, this uh, cavity depth is about 80 millimeters. So what I'm going to be replacing it with is what's known as PIR insulation or polyisocyanurinate or polyiso. That is 70 millimeters deep. So it goes, it goes down to about that depth. And that means there's about a centimeter at the back uh, for uh, airflow and uh, cabling. That's not all. These timber studs are cold bridges and they degrade the insulation resistance uh, a bit more. So even if you fill this cavity, um, it improves the insulation, but not enough. So we have insulated plasterboard on top. And when you add on those two things, that adds, that brings the insulation resistance of the entire wall up to three times what its original construction was. Now doing this during my kitchen upgrade, it goes back to my first principle when it comes to energy saving. Insulate first. 
PIR insulation isn't my first choice. Um, I prefer to use rock wool because it's a lot cheaper and it has many other good properties. But where thickness is a premium, PIR insulation is much better to use. Now when it comes to kitchen upgrades, it's also worth considering your cooking methods. This is a propane gas cooker. And propane costs about seven and a half pence per kilowatt hour. And that compares to electricity, which is about 18 and a half pence per kilowatt hour. Now mains gas is a lot cheaper. It's just under three pence per kilowatt hour at the moment. So on the face of it, it looks like electricity isn't a very good option to consider. However, the heat transfer efficiency between that gas flame and what's inside the cooking pot is only about 35%. You compare that to induction cooking, and the numbers I've seen suggest a 75% heat transfer efficiency. The running costs of electricity are marginally better with induction cooking compared to propane gas. However, if you're still on mains gas, that is still much cheaper to use. Now, there are many other videos on the internet which can do a better job of extolling the advantages of induction cooking over gas cooking. But there's one major advantage that I want to talk about, and that's future proofing. If man-made emissions of CO2 are going to be eliminated, then gas cooking has to go. To illustrate that, the IEA published a report this week. And in that report, they said that new investments in oil and gas extraction have to cease this year. And that basically means that if that turns into government policy, then supplies of gas will gradually start to diminish. And when those supplies diminish, then the price of gas will go up. Heating is the hardest problem to solve when it comes to reducing the size of my household costs. I've made great progress over the years but it's still nowhere near the standards required by the Enerfit, let alone the Passive House schemes. Both of those schemes require huge levels of investment. And the levels of investment we're talking about is about half the value of my property, well over a hundred thousand pounds. And frankly, at that kind of cost, I may as well just knock down my house and start again. And given that the increased value of my house is marginally small, it's not really worth it. So instead, I continue to look for the most cost-effective uh, investments uh, that I can make towards reducing my energy consumption. There are many other options I can explore. External wall insulation could be added to this house, but this is a complex process. We've got downpipes, we've got window sills, and we've got overhangs. These add a lot of complexity to just simply adding insulation to the outside of the house. And it's still an expensive process. So these windows are triple glazed and they're part of the original construction of the property back in 1993. They've got some quite old features. Let's have a look. So, this uh, has just one seal that separates the outside of the world uh, to the inside house. Modern triple glazed windows have got uh, three triple seals. Additionally, they've got argon gas and they've got low emissivity uh, uh, reflective coatings. And that means modern glazing is about twice as efficient as uh, this uh, triple glazing here. This has got a U value of about two watts per meter Kelvin, and modern triple glazing is less than one watt per meter Kelvin. So on the face of it, it looks like triple glazing might be an option, but the installation costs are really very high uh, given the potential savings. Um, yes, glass does yield a lot of heat loss uh, from the house, uh, but a lot of that can be mitigated with retrofits and as I've done here, I've installed uh, honeycomb blinds and that does make a massive difference. Even with a nicely insulated house, 
eventually this boiler has to go. Burning petroleum products is not something that people will want to be doing in 20 years time. However, heat pumps are not a straightforward drop-in replacement for this. The entire radiator system has to be uh, replaced, either with larger radiators or even under floor heating, and that is hugely disruptive work. I hope you found this video interesting to watch. Yeah. If it's helped you make some energy saving investment decisions for your own property, I'll be keen to hear your stories. Be sure to check out my previous energy saving videos on solar panels. I'll be back next month with uh, an update for June. And in the meantime, if you're into hill walking, be sure to check out my hill walking uh, videos that I'll no doubt be making. Thank you for watching.